All right, people, so uh, getting into the reproductive system here. So we're going to start off with male anatomy. So I wanted to kind of preface this with, uh, we're not talking about like genders here, uh, as far as when I say male or female, I'm talking about like the sexes, biological sexes. We will, however, get into um, differences in sexual development or what they kind of uh, used to call uh, intersex, um, uh, those kind of phenomenon. Um, and then we'll, we'll kind of connect the two um, to gender as well. Uh, kind of one of the last lectures we do. So this is all kind of just like straightforward biological sex. Um, what does uh, the male anatomy look like and how does it function and all that. And then some kind of bigger ideas you can pause this and read through uh, what we're trying to get through here with class. So speaking of uh, gender and sex, um, feel free to look up what two-spirit means in uh, native culture. Pretty interesting. Oop, whoop, whoop, whoop. All right, <laughs> so the reproductive system, uh, it is the only biological body system that isn't really necessary to sustaining life, right? At least not your current organism's life. Um, what they do is they have organs called gonads, which produce gametes. Gametes would be the sexual cells, um, so sperm or eggs, and they are always haploid, meaning they have half the number of chromosomes because they are going to combine uh, sperm and egg, will fertilize, and two haploid haploids will make uh, diploid, and so in humans, 23 chromosomes plus 23 chromosomes will pop out a 46 chromosome zygote, and so that will be the start of the embryo and then the fetus. So there you go, and then here's my little shout out to uh, not having kids, and we'll, we'll talk about birth control and things like that in the future, and maybe, maybe the pros and cons of it, so there you go. All right, so starting off with the males here. Uh, male reproductive structures, um, so the external uh, parts, um, basically the penis, the urethra, the scrotum, things you've probably already heard and talked about. What the urethra is would be the um, combined, in males it's the combined exit of um, sperm uh, and semen through the ejaculatory duct, but also what we didn't talk about was the urinary system, and so the urinary bladder um, would actually be sitting uh, in front of a lot of this, um, and that also has a entrance into the urethra. So they combine pretty early on, and here, this is the prostate right here, so they will both combine into here, um, and so they both share the same common tube in males. Um, so the penis, obviously, is just kind of basically an organ, a tool to deposit sperm uh, in the vagina of the females. And then the scrotum would be um, what is considered like the sac that contains the testes, so to keep those uh, safe. But we'll look at all right, why do uh, mammals, um, and not all mammals, have testicles that are outside of the body and dangle because they're like pretty important and there's a lot of pain receptors, right? So a lot of other organisms would keep them up here in the abdomen. Why don't we do that? So, hmm, interesting questions to think about. And we'll get to these other internal and external genitalia coming up. So those are the external ones. Here's the internal ones. So when we kind of do a little cross section this way, so looking at a uh, kind of sagittal cut through here. Um, so we've seen the penis. The testes, who is a scrotum. Um, what's going to be sitting on top of here is the epididymis. So this is where actual sperm production occurs. Uh, and there's these seminiferous tubules, which we'll show you in a second. Sperm will climb into the epididymis, go through what is called the ductus deferens, so ductus deferens, or vas deferens. So you might remember that from like a vasectomy. So you can kind of imagine where they're cutting for that. Uh, and then it kind of loops around. So it's kind of like, you know, maybe not super efficient where how sperm is traveling, right? Not just from here to there. We're looping around, going through the prostate, um, and then it's gonna dump out. So this is the prostate right here, that's a urinary bladder. Um, this is where it will meet up with some seminal glands that produce semen, and then the sperm will travel out through the erect penis. So this is not erect, this is flaccid, um, and then that is how the sperm will e uh, come out. And uh, the testes themselves produce um, some hormones. So we'll talk about these other ones, um, these glands as well, coming up. So this is just kind of a quick overview. Um, what I want to highlight here um, is like the prostates. Um, it's going to produce some uh, part of the fluid, um, which is going to make up the semen. Same with uh, the seminal gland. Uh, the bulbourethral gland is what is uh, kind of the term for pre-ejaculates. So that would be the lubricate. It's going to kind of come out the tip of the penis. Uh, and so it doesn't necessarily contain sperm in it, but we'll talk about why you'll want to be careful with that coming up. Uh, and then the prostate itself, notice its location of the rectum. So this is why prostate exams, one easy 
mostly non-invasive way to check an, for an enlarged prostate is, yeah, you just kind of feel down right here um, with the doctor does with uh, his or her fingers and feel if it's enlarged or not. Um, so there you go uh, for prostate. And here's the tiny little bubble you're there. I think they're also called cowper's glands. So these are all the accessory organs. We'll get to those a little bit later, more in specifics. All right, so I've already kind of ran through the path of sperm pretty quickly, uh, but this is kind of uh, what you would want to know for the um, reproduction test, your final exam. Uh, so again, they're going to start off in the testes, right? This is where the sperm is going to be created, um, but they have to mature. There's like a whole long process we'll get through a little bit later. They'll um, mature. They'll travel up through the ductus deferens, through the little prostate right here, and meet up with uh, the ejaculatory duct, which flows into the urethra, it's all connected in males, and we're going to look at kind of different openings for the urinary and reproductive tracts and females for next lecture. But if we stick with just the testes here, so how they're being formed, um, I mentioned before that they, uh, in other organisms, they're internal, right, and they hang out here. If you ever like dissect a bird, if you get that chance, um, th this is where they'd be hanging out uh, on the back here by the kidneys. Now as we're developing there's this connective uh, tissue right here. Um, we start to get bigger as we develop and grow. This connective band stays the same. So as we're growing, this is basically, it was this pulling the testes down. Uh, and then this is how they would descend, um, usually by about like, I think they say like nine months, either at birth or by nine months afterwards, the, the testes have descended down. Um, so it's kind of like a little traveling motion. As you're getting bigger, the body's enlarging, then they will actually make their way down into the scrotum. Now, there is the incidence of all right, testes that don't actually make it all the way down, though. So this is called crypto-orchidism. Um, so orchid, uh, in Greek myth, um, they thought, you know, if you ate the tubers of an orchid plant, so it would make you more virile, more fertile. It was like a, a big thing. And if you look at like the tubers here, you can kind of tell why they um, uh, thought it had to do with fertility rights. Um, so uh, testes and all these things are usually named after the orchid. That's what it means. Um, and then the orchid flower, you can check that out there. Um, so sometimes the testes, for whatever reason, don't descend. It might just be one that doesn't or both might not. Um, so they have to fit through this little canal right here. And there's a lot of different reasons for it. They don't know uh, really why for all of them. Um, so so it, it can happen um, due to hormone imbalance. It could happen due to the testes just didn't form correctly. Uh, sometimes you might need surgery to get it fixed. Um, it could cause like a case of like testicular cancer if they're abstained up there. Um, usually like painless, but you might see um, some other signs of uh, of uh, fertility issues depending on like why the re what the reason is for the undescended testicle. So there you go, uh, crypto orchism, orchidism. Uh, whoop, going too fast here. All right, so sticking again with the testes here, kind of what is con con controlling them. So you have these scrotal cavities. They are separated by what we call the rafe. So the rafe of the scrotum right here would separate them out because um, you uh, don't really want these wires to get crisped and crossed because look at all these uh, nerves and blood vessels that are going through here. Uh, what I want to point out right here, this, this um, is going through what's called the iguinal canal right here. So you got like the pelvis bone right here. This actually makes like the abdominal muscles in here uh, maybe a little bit not, or not as strong as they would be maybe in females. Um, and so men can develop hernias kind of more often. So inguinal hernias where basically some of the small intestine or other types of tissues or organs will like push their way through this inguinal canal since it's already open, um, usually through some kind of strain or something like that. So I had to put this picture on here and the guy looks hilarious. Um, there's other types of hernias out there. It can happen in multiple spots, but guys will usually get them uh, kind of around the groin area because it's it's kind of already uh, not as strong as it would be um, if, it was, if this was all sealed up. A couple of the muscles um, for elevating uh, and pulling up the testes. So during arousal or when it's cold temperature, we're trying to keep the testes storm maturation or sperm maturation at a certain temperature. We'll raise it if it's cold and lower it if it's getting too warm. But we'll actually talk about this too. Not all creatures do this, right? If creatures are keeping their testes on the inside, well, that's a pretty warm area. So is it is it necessary? Is it useful? Why do we have these dangling testes? Hmm. All right, so we looked at hernias already. Uh, here's just kind of a couple of the 
um, coverings for the testes. They're like any organ, right? They're going to have a serous membrane around them to kind of reduce friction, keep them safe. Uh, and then now what you're seeing are these seminiferous tubules. This is where the actual sperm will be made. There's stem cells in here that will actually pop out the sperm like all the time because you're making millions and millions of sperms uh, all the time. Uh, this REIT testes re refers to like a, a net or a maze. So they are traveling through a, a long maze. Um, so there it is, REIT uh, maze and the efferent. So it's all jumping up into the epididymis and then it'll travel out to the ductus deferens. All right, now uh, castration uh, used to be a thing, the castrati, if you've never heard of them. So what they would do is basically perform a surgery to just get rid of the testes. And so what that's going to do at an early enough age, it's going to stop a lot of hormone production. And so guys will not go through all those kind of secondary, get those secondary sexual characteristics of like a you know voice deepening, dropping. Um, they won't get all the, the hair growth, stuff like that. Um, they'll usually be a little bit shorter. They won't grow as tall. So this guy, Alessandro Moreschi, I think he was like the one of the last castrati living. Um, they actually recorded his video when he was like 50, so not in his prime, but you can listen to that if you want. Um, and so in pets, we call it neutering, right? Or in Spain for uh, females, the tubes. This guy looks like he's enjoying the process, but uh, it eventually got outlawed. But I think at its heyday, like 4,000 kids in Italy were getting castrated like every year. So pretty, pretty crazy. Um, but on the flip side, the ones who made it um, apparently became pretty famous. Um, oh, and there it is again, orchid ectomy. So there's that root orchid again. All right, so this is where I want to kind of get into a little bit with the dangling testes. So if you notice, there are mammals out there that don't have them, like the elephant dangling around. They're in their own kind of unique group, kind of different from other mammals called the aphrotherias. So like aardvarks and other things don't have them. Um, but notice some primates do. One of the interesting uh, thoughts behind the dangling testes is that it is a type of sexual ornamentation so it is something to attract mates um so females found it desirable or uh, for whatever reason and we see that would kind of explain why um this monkey right here oh shoot what is he the vermit oh no vervet um they have uh blue testes right so why would you develop a color down here um if not for like ornamentation they'd work just as well if they were a different color right so this, this is actually the penis as well um What's really interesting, I think, is this video right here. Um, this lady's going to start talking about a concept called uh, aesthetic evolution. She doesn't use that term, but that's, that's what it's called. It's basically how things evolved because organisms just chose those traits in their mates. And the, or, uh, the sex that usually does the choosing is the female, right? So we call this female autonomy, a female's like choice of the mate and so you're going to look at an example of a uh, reptile uh, and uh, lizard penises so this is a snake right here they're called hemipenes they're half penises so um, she'll kind of explain more of this and it's going to be a topic we're going to kind of pick up in our last lecture this idea of how females can really change what a species looks like um, and then the idea of female choice versus maybe like male choice and how there's been kind of a battle between different species of who's really in control of uh, reproduction and kind of behaviors associated with that. It might help us to explain um, some ha uh, behaviors like homosexuality, some behaviors like uh, rape, some behaviors like patriarch or dominance. Um, so there's there's a lot going on with this and they're all theories, but it's kind of interesting things to talk about. All right, so let's jump into uh, how sperm are actually made and then uh, we'll have to jump into the next video here. So it's happening in those seminiferous uh, tubules. So the ones that are like basically little mazes uh, in the testes, um, the process is called spermatogenesis, so the creation of sperm. Um, basically what's happening is it's gonna go through mitosis and then meiosis. So you guys probably remember meiosis from biology. There's some other cells hanging out in here to help out what are called nurse cells. So like nurses, they're helpful. So they're gonna help provide nutrients to the developing sperm. Um, and then they're also going to form a blood testes barrier because we want to, as these sperm are developing, um, we don't want the immune system to come in and start killing them off and seeing them as like foreign or something like that. So that, that's helpful for there. Um, and then there's also within here's the endocrine cells. Those are going to be the ones in the testes that produce testosterone um, and an androgens. So and is like the root word for like man. Uh, 
to help those hormones, or what we consider male hormones, although they are in females as well. Alright, so we're going to pick up with this in the next video.